Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome back to Projections, where this week, haptics. The sense of touch is the topic. I've been saying that haptics is like the next frontier since we got our VR headsets. I really think that that's going to be the thing that makes this world seem real. Maybe I read too much Ready Player One. <laughs> well, it's something we definitely want, Yeah. right? We feel like even the vibration and controllers gives us some sense of contact, Right. but we want something that's more directly correlated to the forces that exactly. we feel in the real world. We've seen a bunch of different implementations from gloves you wear to, to things that have actuators that push, give you resistance yes. for your individual fingers, Right. and it's a tough problem to solve. Yeah, the problem with that is that you can push through things no matter how much force they apply. It's not like they stop your hand. It would be very dangerous if they did. <laughs> that's true, that's true, but there's, it's just they physically can't either. I yes. mean, that you're gonna push through things, uh, any kind of glove that gives you that sensation. So you have to sort of work with it. It's not much more than a rumble in it, really any sense of it. Well, a company working against the grain with haptics uh, is working with not forces that push against you and give you resistance, right. but shear forces. Right, so that's like if you take something against your skin and you move it across your skin, it's the stretching of your skin laterally. It's friction, yeah, essentially, which if you think about it, you feel kind of everywhere, whether you're rubbing your hands against a table. It might not be much, but it's something it's there. It's there, or if you're holding a physical controller and you're moving anything, you're mm -hmm. gonna feel the, the weight of the object actually right. move against your skin because it has weight. And the nice thing about that force that you can simulate is that it's this constantness. It's like it can be heavy and it is just constantly there. Uh, no matter where it, you move in space, and it can just sort of you can simulate that in a way that I feel like is more compelling. The company's called Tactical Haptics, and it was started by a researcher who had done a lot of research into shear forces in his lab, and has developed these custom controllers that can adapt to uh, like Oculus tracking mm -hmm. or Steam VR tracking, and they're the really unique looking controllers. In fact, let's let him explain how this works. Hey everybody, Norm here at Augmented World Expo, and we met Will here who runs Tactical Haptics. You guys have an interesting haptic solution with your own design controller that, uh, tell me about the concept, because uh, this gives force feedback in a way we've never seen before. Right, so in a nutshell, when you interact with the world, it's composed of kinesthetic, those outside forces and motions, and tactile. And the way we, we the way this works is we create tactile illusions by capturing your kinesthetic motion and then responding with the dominant tactile, which happens to be a shear or frictional forces, within the grip of the controller by moving these little plates. So there are two plates here on each of these controllers, one as you grab it, one for like the, where your fingers are and one for where your palm is, and you're talking about shear forces, really moving them vertically, and with the combination of that, how much do they move? A couple millimeters up, a couple millimeters down that can give the illusion of what type of force it is. So you experience it, it's everything from elasticity and inertia to impacts and resistance. You know, bring your, your VR experiences to life, real force feedback. Resistance is the one that makes the most sense to me. Right? Right. I think in a demo I was holding uh, what looked like a rod and I think about when I lift something heavy, it should, there should be something that's pushing against my hand and so you're slowly moving these plates. That makes sense, how much like, how fast do they have to move to simulate the different type of forces? It's a good question. Uh, I've never really thought about, like, the speed. The, the most important thing is that they do it on time mm. to have really low latency. So it's the same thing uh, if you're, you've been covering the VR stuff for a while, Oculus, their mantra was uh, motion to photons, right? Yeah. It's like 20 milliseconds was their magic number. It's the same thing for your touch system. Mm. It's the same thing that, you know, like, you have to fool this to make it feel like it's on time. Right. So the main thing that we've been focusing on is having these things respond quickly, meaning that we go from where you're actually being tracked into the physics simulation and back out into the simulated forces and then the internal forces that are applied via these little slime plates. And you're, are you creating profiles based on the simulation? You think like certain things, weight is supposed to feel a certain way that cal then uh, is associated with a certain type of movement here? So uh, yes and no. So uh, no in that, it's actually way simpler than that. If you know how to make a physics simulation, which a game developer knows how to take stuff from Unity or Unreal, make a really simple physics simulation with some masses and springs, mm -hmm. and they know how to compute forces from that. If you know how to compute that force, it doesn't matter what's causing that force. If it's caused from a, a, a mass moving through space, it'll feel like weight, because that's what your brain is used to experiencing forces as a function of. It's if universal it's a, variable. Right, and if it's a spring, you're used to it, it probably linearly increasing in terms of force. We, that also maps to linearly increasing 
shear while you're moving through space. So all these things are just modeled as physics simulations, give us a force vector that then we map into how would the friction be applied if this external force was there. And so your calibration is all in mapping that vector as a friction. To... That's right, it's, and it's really simple. It's, it's, eh, there's way less here than meets the eye. It's, it's, <laughs> it's meant to be simple, and it's meant to be intuitive because these are the same friction forces you experience all the time yeah. when you're doing everyday things, you know, whether you're shoveling or you're using a pen, you're used to these friction forces, and you, you're so used to them when you don't actually have the physical resistance uh, added to the, you know, the outside on the controller, you're used to these friction forces then integrating into what feels like a kinesthetic event, you know, a resistance, as opposed to like stuff moving around in my hand. Now, you told us you have a background in research, and is this where the idea came out of? And what were those lessons from the research? Like, is shear force enough? In fact, you know, in the research scenario, it actually started off that we used it for direction cues mm. and later mapped it into like a substitution for forces or something to com complement forces, but we weren't really substituting, uh, we weren't really complementing, it was really just kind of creating these illusions that really shouldn't exist. And it was the discovery that these illusions could exist without external forces, just with internal forces is really the magic of makes, what makes it work. So there's no plan to combine it with other types of haptics or does that even ruin the illusion? Uh, no, actually, it's funny because we were doing some stuff on the medical side. We were using little robotic devices, like there's a device called the Phantom. Uh, it has a little stylus interface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a stylish form factor for a while, and we were augmenting that with a little bit of shear feedback. And the interesting thing is, is that you know it made everything feel a lot stiffer mm. when you augment it with a little shear feedback. And then we did this little trick where we turn off the force feedback, and they'd only have the shear feedback. And they'd say, you can turn off the force feedback now, just because they were so automatically interpreting it as forces. Right. Now, so, so the answer, I guess, to your question is... You don't need anything else. You cool. could use it to complement force feedback, and it makes it even better. But in the case where you don't want to have a big robotic arm coming up from the ground, and I want this in the consumer space, and I want to be able to walk in infinite hallways as long as I can track myself, you can give compelling force-like feedback. Mm. The other innovation you guys are doing are the way these two controllers interact with each other. Can you talk about the magnetic system and the mounting system? Sure. Um, maybe I'll just do this. So. What we did was we, we focused on ability to do what you want in the game at the moment you want to do it. And a lot of people will have separate controllers and they're kind of tenuously holding their Vive or the touch controllers up here and they're driving a car. But it turns out like if you just have a very simple magnetic connection, it's not permanent, it's easy to take apart. But this creates this embodiment effect that this now feels like a different object to me just the same way that this could feel like a different object. And rather than hovering around, now it's a single solid object. And the way you interpret the feedback from it is, you know, uh, inherits that embodiment effect. Mm. So it feels like a big hefty machine gun. It feels like a more cumbersome wheel that I'm turning. And then you can give the feedback that transforms that experience at the same time that corresponds with that new peripheral. And, and how many poses have you figured out that so, you can do with all these magnets? Standard game pad, machine gun right-handed or left-handed. There's kind of top to top, so this would be like I'm um, motorcycle, uh, bicycle, on a motorcycle or a uh, snowmobile, this would be like the throttle. Um, that's one of the other cool things about it. Here would be like a pole arm or a, like I'm flag bearer in a parade. That's probably the most boring VR <laughs> application. Um, you could go bottom to bottom, it's a little bit cumbersome, but uh, you could do that. Um, you could go into the side here, this would be like I'm going and turning, opening a valve, for instance. This would be Winter Twin Powers. Uh, I don't know how many poses there are, but you know, six, seven. Is right, the, is the right. It's, it's very versatile. Um, the uh, actuators themselves, um, are those like, is that the max strength? Is there a room for growth there? Are you guys iterating on that? So we've kind of iterated. This is kind of like a happy medium. We actually limit the forces because mm. we don't want to hurt people. There's, um, it's, it's kind of like the art of the, the good enough and having it so that it's responsive, but uh, not uh, able to produce forces that you know might pinch somebody and hurt somebody and create a bad experience for people. So it's, it's a balance right now. It's applying a couple pounds of force. And where do you hope to see this in the marketplace? So our entry, actually we just opened up uh, pre-orders yesterday, coincidentally. Um, we're initially focused on enterprise, and that's anything from training for businesses, um, whether it's medical or maintenance crew. Um, we have just general people doing R&D on like, why does the solution work that are interested in this as well. But obviously in the gaming space, uh, 
And for us, it's uh, partnering with um, the VR integrators. So they're going out to the arcades and creating these wonderful experiences that you can't have in the home. Very cool. Thank you so much, yeah. Will. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you as well. Okay, Jeremy, so I don't know if the video accurately captured how we felt when we were using demos, because there were a bunch of demos that we were put through right. to experience these shear forces on the grips. You know, I'm using the Vive controllers here as an example, but the, the idea is that basically on the front and the back where your hands grab, there are these pads that move up and down. Right, yeah, these, these pads that have ridges in them that can more or less grip your hands. Mm -hmm. And so when you're climbing a rope, uh, they might move up a little bit, they might pull down. And it doesn't take much to, because you're holding the controller, you're exerting your own force to keep your hands connected to the controller. It doesn't take much for that to actually cause a sensation of not pain or anything, but it is definitely a strong sensation. This is not a weak, feedback device, like some of the pressure sensitive things that we've used before, or even like rumble. And also like, unlike rumble, whereas rumble is instantaneous and they can sort of do a repetitive thing, this is constant. And also like perfectly synced to the action that's on screen. I think the syncing was what the big takeaway was, how it's, it's convincing. Because if you're just holding the controller and feeling the actuators move, yeah. I'm not convinced that that is any type of thing I'm holding or any type of action, but once right. it's paired with a, a bow and arrow and pulling them back, and the thing I think I like the most was probably the mace. Mm -hmm. I was holding a mace and swinging it, and as the heavy virtual ball of the mace was moving up and down, I was feeling the handle almost loosen and tighten from as, my grip. As you say that to me, like I'm thinking as, an, as a viewer, it actually doesn't, I don't, almost don't believe you <laughs> because <laughs> there's these two things that are moving like this yeah. on your controller. How in the world does that map to this? And yet it was so, it, it, it actually, felt really It actually good. really feels good. And it's, so whatever math they're doing, that's part of the secret sauce. It's not just getting these things to move. It's actually making a movement sensation or making these two things do the appropriate thing. Are they in sync together? Are they offset? Is yeah. the timing different? And it, th making that sync up with whatever the motion is on the screen is part of the magic. And one of the neat things about that demo is when you would put the mace down, yes. it would release the tension. You would feel like there was a, a lighter. The thing you were holding was lighter, right. even though no weight has actually changed. Right. It's, it's all about the relative sensation mm -hmm. of your pads on, on your, uh, your, your hand. And the th also the cool thing is that they don't need to design the feedback for each individual item. It's just physics. Right. Right. So they, as long as they've calibrated for the weight of certain objects, That's they it. know you're holding things that are either like they're gripped, right? Like a grip of a, a pistol, mm -hmm. or the grip of a, a pole or a mace or a rope. Like they, they can simulate any of those things. And it works equally well for those kind of pulse sensations that we would traditionally get from rumble or linear actuators, like a firing a gun. Like it does that perfectly well too, but it's those forces that are constant where if you lift something heavy or like we had a gravity gun where we would point it at a small cube and move it around and we had the same kind of sensation, you could feel the difference between a small and a big cube. It yeah. just felt heavier because as you lifted it up, it took longer for these to fall into position. Mm -hmm. It's neat. I mean, I, I came away really, really surprised because there's a lot of people trying new things in haptics and a lot of new technologies at AWE in particular. And this was a small booth in the back of one of the darker halls. And I went, like, this is probably my favorite haptic experience that I've had. Yeah, and the other thing that they've designed this controller is this magnetic system for interlocking yeah. the controllers, which also is this whole other tech that is independent of haptics, but also just makes sense for VR controllers. It is definitely cool because it allows you to position them in ways that lend themselves to various types of controllers. This isn't necessarily something that's exclusive to a haptic solution. Yeah. This would be great for VR controllers in general. Like, I, it, that kind of makes me surprised that one of the other majors haven't come up with some kind of solution that does this out of the box because it's a lot easier to like make handles that could be, be a steering wheel, but that lock together or a motorcycle. if there's a system. Yep. Or, you know, pe the people who play FPS games would love- A two-handed yeah, system. Yeah, some sort of perfect like two-handed system. It makes a lot of sense for that. Yeah, we don't know when or how this is gonna be a consumer product, but they definitely wanna productize 
utilize it. It may not be for the home, but it may be for places like LBEs where people can invest in the types of controllers. And one interesting thing that we do a follow up uh, is we're wondering whether just one axis of, of shear force. Because it is only currently one axis. Yeah, yeah. is that, do you get any extra benefit from you know two axes uh -huh. or multiple axes of movement? And the answer is in the research, absolutely. But in terms of making a product, one axis was enough. And for our, our demo, absolutely enough. Oh, totally. I was surprised it was only moving a few millimeters. Yeah. It felt like a couple centimeters. Like it, it caused, it's, they said that they had to rein it in so that it doesn't cause a painful sensation. Um, so that tells me that like it doesn't take much movement at all and they have plenty of lateral space in order to create the sensations that they need. I mean, um, your hands are where you have most of your, your nerves, yeah. right? So you should be able to feel all those subtle to be clear, it doesn't. It is not a virtual reality controller itself. It's not a tracked controller. It has its own IMU in there, but they have attachments so that you can connect any off-the-shelf controller from Oculus or Vive, um, and so it it is a accessory for VR controllers. Yeah, so keep an eye out for that company, Tactical Haptics, and we hope it pops up in places that we can use it for various for sure. experiences soon. Uh, before we go, we want to talk about one game, a recommendation that both of us have been playing. Uh, this is a game called Free Diver, mm -hmm. and I know you talk, Jeremy about loving different locomotion mechanics. Yep. This is a very unique locomotion mechanic. Locomotion for me is paramount. Like when I get into VR, what I want is a sensation of moving through the world that I can't do in real life or that if I did, I'd probably be very, very scared. And Lone Echo gives me that. The Echo games do. You know, um, Jet Island, Windlands, uh, Climby. This is another one of those kind of games. And if you play the Lone Echo games, it's very similar to that on the base level. You are a free diver. You are diving underwater, and you can move through the space by grabbing geometry and pulling yourself through Rocks. the space. Rocks or walls or anything around you. But you can also swim. So that's when you do a swimming sensation like this. You're doing the breath stroke, and you're pulling yourself through. You can, you can doggy paddle if you want to. You can pull <laughs> yourself this way. But it's an interesting locomotion mechanic that we have not seen yet, and it's smooth locomotion that's tied to your hand movements, so it does lend itself to comfort. And in fact, even turning, while you can physically turn, you know, to do a uh, type, type of turning, there is no snap, instant snap turn. You actually have to paddle. Yeah. And you can change the momentum, but you can actually paddle and drift. I actually went into this comfort settings to try to turn on snap turn because I was not sure I could handle that when I first tried it. It's a little, it's a little offsetting, but you can dial it down so that each paddle to the left or right only causes you to move so much. You mm -hmm. can dial that down or up. I ended up turning it back up because I ended up getting comfortable with it. Yeah. But it, it that was definitely an interesting choice on their part. And I have not seen that kind of smooth turning done before ever. Now the gameplay and the story itself, it's about a, an hour long game. It's a very short yeah. vignette of a story, but you're a free diver on a capsized research vessel and you're trying to escape this ship. And so a very compelling story at the front, you know, the, the ship is upside down oh my gosh. and it's filled with yeah. water and you have to survive. And it's a survival game. You are going from room to room, finding pockets of air, finding oxygen tanks. And while you can hold your breath for a long time, <laughs> It gave me this sense of claustrophobia yeah. and, this and sometimes intensity you, that... you don't find oxygen. <laughs> you know, if you're me, like you miss that oxygen tank back there, and you, the character starts to go glum, 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 glum. <laughs> you're watching your oxygen meter go down over here, and it's extremely stressful. Like you were telling me that you would come to oxygen pockets that were very narrow, and I would tiptoe and like tip my head up, my chin up, and, yeah, and it tracks my head so I could breathe and get in that real pocket in yeah. real air yeah. in life. And I was holding my breath for some of the parts. Yeah. Like, it's it's puzzle-based, so you're trying to get out of these rooms from room to room, and you know, I'll get my pocket of air and then dive back down and kind of look around, and, and then, oh no, I'm running out of air, and go find that pocket of air. And so, like, from from a pacing mechanic, from a pace, this yeah. gameplay design, I, I love the kind of immersion that this game brings. Yeah, it's like Norm said, it's only about an hour long. I actually played through it in about 45 minutes, so it's on that Vader Immortal kind of scope and price. So if you if you have a quest and you, and you know that game, it's kind of the same thing where you're paying for. Uh, you know, a small amount of money for a small amount of really good game. Like, this, the quality here is very, very high. Yeah, graphics look great. Yeah. The amount of geometry, the detail, the ship looks really good. A lot of voice acting and dialogue. I want to see them do more. Chapter 2, 3, 4, whatever right. they can it's, do. It's a very James Cameron kind of inspired um, 
story that I'm sure took some inspiration from the abyss. But I, well, I would love to see this story continue further than uh, than we got to see it end in this one for okay. sure. Well, that's Free Diver. It's available right now on the Steam VR store. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. Only nine dollars. And uh, that does it this week. We'll have more coverage, of course, in the future. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye. But it's something it's there. It's there. Or even when you're holding something, you're holding a physical controller. I threw that off. I'm just going to go say that sentence again.